I've been playing these pieces for quite a long time and this section is one that brought me a lot of difficulty when I first learned the piece. It was kind of one of those um, passages that I was afraid of when I used to perform it on stage and I would rush a lot and things would go wrong in that passage a lot. So I've practiced it very much and in many different ways. So I just want to share some of my top things that helped me get over my fear of this passage. This is Danai and today I want to film a little bit of a practice vlog. I am practicing Schumann's In der Nacht today, which is the fifth piece from his Fantasiestücke Opus 12 cycle. It's such a beautiful cycle. I really, really love every single piece of those and I will be playing them on my US tour. So every recital will include the Schumann Fantasiestücke, so this is why I'm practicing them right now. And I thought that I would use In der Nacht to make a little tutorial because I find that this piece really has so many different aspects that are interesting to share how I practice them and also how I see them because there are many technical difficulties but also musical difficulties that come together in that piece. I want to mention two things. I just did my slow run through, which I always do in the beginning. And there are two things that I really look out for in this piece. The first one is that there is a polyphonic element to this piece. I recently made a video on polyphonic pieces and how I practice them, but it was much more geared towards Bach and Baroque pieces. This is a different type of polyphony, but it is still very much there. There are different voices and it's very important to bring out those voices in a different way when you compare them to each other because otherwise the entire piece is just going to sound like one big sound blob if you don't differentiate between all the voices. So this is the first thing that I really look out for. Already the first element we have, which is the upper voice, and then we have the fast notes, which are, so together it's, and then we have, which has more importance than this one. So there are already three levels, the lowest level being, then second level, and the third level, and underneath all of that, we have the bass. That's kind of like a, a constant. So we have four voices, you could say, and we have to make sure that we bring them out in different ways. And this is quite hard because this piece is quite fast and quite virtuoso. So we really have to practice to differentiate between the voices, even at the fast speed. And a couple of images that I was taught when I was younger are, for example, that you have an even surface of sand and then you put your two fingers inside and the one that has the more important voice goes deeper than the other one. So you really have to be able to kind of split your hand in two and really play the fingers that have a more important voice differently from the other ones. So in this case it's five four that have to be stronger and one two three which is kind of counterintuitive because these are stronger fingers than five and four but one two three have to be very soft and flimsy and kind of just create an atmosphere and five four have to be very strong this whole polyphonic element is something that happens in this piece a lot and i'll touch on some other passages as well where you really have to look out for it the second thing i want to say is just general is the character the character of in der nacht is a very specific character and i must say that it took me a long time to yeah even be able to grasp it and to get into it because Obviously, it's kind of a tumultuous uh, atmosphere that's being created. There's a lot happening and it's, um, well, I don't want to say exciting. It's more like suspense, I would say. You're like 
waiting for something to happen. There's this thing, this constant that's going on in the piece. And then there are these little explosions. And then also later on some bigger ones. And then there are also different colors like... Where it starts with a, a little bit of an explosion, but then it calms down. And the important thing is that within all of that, also within that first figure, where you want to make the suspense really audible, you still really have to look out to stay in tempo because the danger is there yet will, you, that you will just rush towards the note where you feel the most suspense has to be created. So for example, but no, it has to be one, two, three, four. And also here, you could go, but it's, so you really have to be in time and try to create this suspense, not by changing the speed or by doing huge rubati, but by creating a different color and a different character. So I think these are the two main difficulties of this piece, aside from the technical aspect. It also has polyrhythmical stuff. So for example, here, the left hand is playing four and the right hand is playing three. So, so that also is in there, but I feel like that's not the main difficulty. The main difficulty is creating the different levels of voices and also creating that character without rushing. So this is what I will be practicing. different technical exercises for my left hand especially to secure that ongoing 16th note uh, passage that is happening throughout the entire piece to make sure that that is really rhythmical and once I have that secured I'm going to get into creating that character and practicing creating that suspense. I'm not going to get into detail about the technical exercises because you can see them in many of my other videos I've mentioned a lot of them, so if you're a regular viewer, you will recognize them anyway. So I don't want to get into the whole how I divide up the passage uh, details in this video. I just want to focus on the piece as a whole. But if you want to know more details, then go ahead and watch my videos on how to play fast passages. I've made several videos on that and you will find all these exercises explained in detail. <laughs> Thank you. 
passage, in case you have the score in front of you, that's the passage starting in bar 19. This is the first time where I would suggest you do a little bit of a rubato. So what are rules if they're not meant to be broken? Because I mentioned before, don't make any rubato to accommodate the character. But of course, that was just a, a general comment. Don't make a rubato in every single bar. Of course, a couple of rubatos are very beautiful and I find very fitting. So in bar 19 is the first tiny rubato passage that I would personally recommend. It's the first time where it starts with this kind of excited or a little bit of an explosion, but then it calms down into this beautiful melody. And that's where I take a little bit of time. So that's something that I wanted to mention. And the second thing is you might have noticed that when I practice the fast passages in the left hand, I practice them without the pedal. So that's also an important tip that I would uh, want to share with you to just leave out the pedal when you first want to make sure that everything is clean and clear and then add it back in when you're creating the character and the atmosphere. But just for pure technical practice, leave it out because you're just making it easier and kind of cheating on yourself when you put in the pedal and something's will sound better than they actually are. So just be strict with yourself, take it out, listen to everything that's happening, and once it is perfect without the pedal, you can add it back in. starting from bar 69 onwards is one that I find particularly tricky. It has the heading etwas langsamer, meaning a little bit slower. So it is calmer than what we had before. But I find that this 16th voice in the left hand, well, and it's also kind of divided into the right hand, is written in a very strange way because the fifth finger always starts the figure on the last 16th of the bar. So you're not starting on a heavy beat, you're starting on the last 16th of the bar, which makes it kind of strange when you play it. So I practiced it in different ways in order to make sure that it's regular. And then when I play it, I try to just take my time to place that fifth finger, to not go, but to really take my time. Because I have to get it together with the fourth 16th that my right hand is playing. So I really wanna take my time. And I find that this passage also allows for that since it is etwas langsamer, a little bit slower, so you really can do that. 
And then the other thing that I do is I practice the melody, which is in the right hand. And very important is that I practice it with the fingering that I will be using. So I practice it separately, but with a very strange fingering, five, four, five, because that's what I will be using when I'm adding the 16th notes that I'm playing with my first and second and third finger when I play everything together. So I practice that melody separately. I try to create a beautiful legato. I try to make it sound as beautiful as I can with that fingering. And then I put it together. And I find it important that the melody sounds so calm, zero influenced by what's happening underneath all the uncomfortable stuff. So the melody just has to be calm and serene. Just singing and this is happening underneath. You don't want the melody to go. You want it to have a very natural phrase and not be influenced. So once again, you have to split your hand into two and make that melody sound beautiful and the other stuff is on a different level. starting in bar uh, 122 is also another tricky section. I've been playing these pieces for quite a long time and this section is one 
that brought me a lot of difficulty <laughs> when I first learned the piece. It was kind of one of those um, passages that I was afraid of when I used to perform it on stage and I would rush a lot and things would go wrong in that passage a lot. So I've practiced it very much and in many different ways. So I just want to share some of my top things that helped me get over my fear of this passage. The first thing, of course, is that I did all types of technical exercises to just approach it from different perspectives and from different sides to get it really internalized in my fingers and in my brain. But that's clear anyway. That's something that I do with many technically hard passages. Now, what helped me here are two different things. The one thing is that I stopped focusing on it and thinking about it as a purely technical passage. Yes, it is technically hard with all these different uh, things starting not together, but one after another. So you have and the right hand is doing like after each other. It really helps us to think of it in a, in a musical way. So not just purely technical, but to think of the little crescendi that are happening. So for example, the starting piano. and developing so these little crescendi can help a lot and the second thing is that i have this thought that it's kind of it's it's kind of a comparison where i see my fingers are sticking to the keys i know it sounds kind of strange but i like to make them i like to think that they're sticking to the keys because that makes me not rush so I feel like they're heavy, sticking to the keys, and I really take my time. And I have this mental image of a hill or a mountain, which I have to go up. And I want to get to the top, which is the end of this passage, but I'm not going to get to the top by rushing because you can't. It's going uphill, so you actually have to take some extra time. So it's just this little bit of stretching that really helps keep me in check and not rush. So these two things, thinking of the musical development and then just thinking of this taking my time walking up the mountain, these two things really helped me get over my fear of that passage. Everything after that is just repetition, so there's not really a lot of new things to be said. I just want to mention the very end. <laughs> Portissimo, and I just want to say there once again to not rush, especially when you're getting into the. There's a tendency to rush, and I think it's very powerful to just keep the pulse, keep the rhythm. I think the effect is going to be even bigger. And then in the very final bars, I think it's very effective and kind of important to just put the bass out. He writes accents on it and I think that's just the final exclamation that he's making in this piece. Just really bring out those accents in the bass and then end it on a very fortissimo note. Yeah, so this was my practice vlog on In der Nacht by Schumann from the Fantasiestück August 12. I hope that you enjoyed it. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. This is a bit of a different video format than what I usually do where I detail the tutorials, but I have made some practice vlogs in the past and I remember that you liked them. So I hope that you enjoyed this one as well. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you've played this piece or if you are planning on learning it. It's very beautiful. Having said that, if you find this very hard and complicated, this is probably one of the hardest pieces in the cycle. There are also easier pieces in the cycle opus 12. For example, the first one, this arms is incredibly beautiful and much easier, technically speaking. So feel free to check out the Fantasistic opus 12. They're very beautiful. Personally, one of my favorites that he's written for piano together with his fantasy. So if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel. That would help me a lot. And I will see you again in my next video next week. Bye.